everybody, welcome into my shop. So I have launched semester two of my hand tool school and one of the things we're going to be tackling this semester is cutting curves. Well, in order to cut curves, you need a bow saw or sometimes known as a turning saw. This model is from Gramercy or toolsforworkingwood.com. You hear the term bow saw, you hear frame saw, and you hear turning saw a lot. This is really what I would consider to be more of a frame saw. This is a larger saw, obviously, and a big wide blade. Uh, this is excellent for ripping. It's great for resawing. It is not a curve cutting saw or a turning saw. The turning saw is really very similar to the coping saw or the fret saw. Coping saw. The coping saw is still a really effective tool. Just you can see that it's a smaller blade. These are generally about six inch blades. And if you're working on fuller size furniture pieces and you're cutting curves by hand, the turning saw is really the way to go. The 12 inch span here is excellent. The Gramercy model is made out of hickory, so it's very lightweight, yet very, very strong. Now I bought this model probably about six months ago, I guess, and I've been working, working with it for a while. More than, shoot, almost two years ago, I bought the turning saw kit that Gramercy makes, thinking I would just much rather make my own saw. For one reason or another, things got busy. Um, I launched this thing called the Hand Tool School, just whatever, lots of excuses. I wasn't able to make that kit. Um, and I went ahead and bought this saw because I needed a way to be cutting curves by hand. Of course, I could go down to the other end of my shop and use that bandsaw there too. I think you'll find that there's a, a level of accuracy uh, a level of um, just agility that comes with a turning saw that you'll want to add it to your shop even if you're going to continue to use a bandsaw. Most of the time my bandsaw has a resaw blade in it and that's what I'm using it for is resawing or the occasional long rip cut. If I want to just cut a small curve section it's really kind of a pain to go down and swap out my blade and put in a quarter inch blade on my bandsaw. In this instance, I have an eighth inch blade here, so I can turn an even tighter radius, and it makes really very fast work. Uh, as I said, I have the 18 PPI blade in here now. If you put the 10 PPI blade in, it cuts very, very fast. So what I want to show you guys, and to those of my hand tool school students who are watching today, since we're going to be cutting curves this semester, I'll show you how to make your own turning saw just using the Gramercy kit. And the kit comes with, really, these two little brass pins that are in the, the, this wood does not come with it. Just these two little brass pins, and you can get the kit to come with the three 12-inch long blades. If you go online to toolsforworkingwood.com, you can actually print out uh, full-sized patterns. You need legal paper to do that, but you can print out full-sized patterns that you can then glue onto your wood. And these make the arms. Really all you need is these three pieces of wood for the frame. This is my, my cross piece, my two uprights. And you can see I've actually already cut out the, the basic shape of this. I cut this on my bandsaw. Then all you'll need to do is cut a couple of mortises right in the ends. You need to drill holes through the bottom here to fit these pegs. You'll need to cut tenons on the cross piece. The only other wood you're going to need is a couple of blocks for the handles. You can buy the handles already turned from Gramercy or you can turn them yourself. The cool thing about this kit is you can supply whatever wood you want. Obviously the hickory of this is nice because it's really light but it's really not all that exciting. I chose some nice bird's eye maple. It's going to be a little bit heavier but it is a nice strong wood and it will take the stress of the bow saw nicely. The whole frame once it's cut to size, gets tapered down in this direction. It's, it's fattest right here where the mortise is. Then it tapers down to the top and it tapers down to the bottom. Same thing, all of the edges are kind of rounded over. This cross piece has a series of wide chamfers that run down it. It kind of narrows everything out, but the more wood you remove from chamfers means the lighter the overall saw will be. It's just a little trick to lighten everything up. Now you can sink the mortise while you still have a square blank or you can cut it out 
already and then do the mortise afterwards. Once it's already cut, I find that doing the mortise is best to be done by hand. If you have the luxury and you have a square blank, you can use a drill press or a mortising machine to uh, form this mortise. Since this one's already formed, I'm going to come over here to the bench and I'll chop it out by hand. So I'll just grab my quarter inch mortising chisel and I want the mortise depth to be about three eighths of an inch deep. You make it too deep, you're not going to have as much play to be able to for this cross piece to actually be able to flex. When you tighten up the toggles on this, the, the twine side actually comes closer together. And if this is a really, really deep mortise, it's going to be really hard for any kind of shifting back and forth. The Gramercy tool saw actually has a concave shoulder here to allow this to rotate back and forth. They say in their instructions that if you're going to use dedicated blades, the 12 inch blades, you can set a square shoulder. You don't have to worry about it um, shifting that much. But still, you want as much meat behind the mortise. If you drill the mortise too deep, you're going to end up weakening this back side here. And with all the, the pressure really on this focal, on this fulcrum right here, if there was only a quarter inch of wood in the back, it's going to be really weak. So a 3 8 inch deep mortise is going to be plenty to register the cross piece, but still provide a lot of long grain here for strength. And I'm going to pair, pair these walls. I don't want to hit it with the mallet now because I have a very small area between where this curve is cut and where the mortise begins. And I can very easily pop that end grain out. This is the advantage of chopping the mortise before you've shaped it because obviously now I've got all this wood backing it up. Once the curve is cut, you don't have that much, and you can kind of blow through the mortise a little bit faster that way. But I figured I would show you guys that it is possible to do after it was shaped. So what I'm going to do now is go over to my drill press, and I'm going to drill the hole for the handle, for the brass blade holder. I'll drill those on the end, and I've used the template right here to transfer my lines across the face and then marked a center line right in the middle. That little dot right there is actually marked with a scratch hole, and that's where I need to drill to be exactly in the middle. And I've done the same thing on both pieces. Now that all the mortising and joinery and the holes have been drilled, it's time to actually cut out the support. And you can use a bandsaw for this, or if you have a turning saw, use that. Then you want to use a spoke shave to just refine that cutout. And it doesn't have to be really, really pretty here because there's more shaping to be done. The key is you want to keep the whole thing square and get it right on the lines before you go any further. Now getting in those inside curves, this is where uh, files and rasps come into play and just refining of that final shape. Now I'm going to cut the tenons on the cross piece. And you know, I'm going to cut them by hand. We're talking very small tenons here. They're uh, three-eighths of an inch wide and a quarter inch long. Just a few uh, fine adjustments here and there to get a good slip fit on these joints. Again, the saw should stay together, you know, of its own accord. But you don't want it, obviously, really, really tight. This would be just the same way you would fit a mortise and tenon joint anywhere else. But remember, we're not going to glue this together. These need to remain loose so that as you tighten down the toggle and the saw blade tightens, these will actually flex in and out. So now, with the three I fit together and ready to go, I'll need to shape them. I want to take more wood off and taper this down at the top to about a quarter inch wide, add a little bit of shaping, round over the bottom, and chamfer all the edges to make the, to lighten up the overall weight. But what I want to do is first get the rest of the pieces together, turn my knobs 
assemble it, tension the whole thing up, make sure everything is good, working well, even make sure that it cuts well before I invest a bunch of time in shaping and creating, you know, reducing the weight and creating more of an aesthetic appeal. I want to make sure that it works first. So let's head over to the lathe and we'll shape the two handles. I'm going to turn my handles using a Jacobs chuck and the easy wood turning tools. These are a little bit different from your traditional turning tools and very much like a scraper. So you want to set the height appropriately so that the blade is in line with the center line of your workpiece. Now this is not quite a scraping action, it's still cutting, but you can see the tool is registered flat on the rest. And I just press forward to very quickly turn that block into a cylinder. Now I use my Galbert caliper. This is an excellent tool for precisely sizing your blank. And I'm gonna get down to a one and a quarter inch thickness and turn the whole cylinder one and a quarter. Then I'll mark out my transition points using the pattern that I printed out. And I'll come in and size those to the appropriate thicknesses all on the way. Now I'll switch over to the Easy Finisher, which is a round head and allows works very much like a spindle gouge and allows me to very quickly round in down to my thicknesses following my pattern lines to create the basic shape for my handle. This is the far handle. This is the, um, the, the secondary handle, if you will. Now because I've epoxied in that brass piece already, you can see the Jacobs chuck holds it very firmly and I can remove the tailstock, which was really just there for support and balance. And I'll come back with the rougher to use as kind of a parting tool to square off that end. And then back with the easy finisher to finally refine the shape and get it down exactly where I want it and get ready for sanding. So sanding, just like anything else, I'll work my way through the grits. I think I worked this all the way up to 600 grit. Applied some Tripoli cream and then some Shellow Wax cream for uh, the finish on it. And this is pretty much the same thing I've used time and time again, but you can see that quilted sapili just comes out beautiful. I loosen up the Jacobs chuck and I've got a handle all ready to go. With my handles turned, the last thing I can do before I can test it and tension it is to make the toggle peg for the top that actually acts to tension the saw. And I went ahead and turned this on my lathe just like I did the handles. And I, I used a, a pin blank that I had floating around. It was a, some sort of curly species. I wanna say it might've been a Thuya um, from South America or Central America, but I'm really not sure. It's a similar in color to the Sapili, a little bit pinker, but it had a cool uh, curl, kind of tiger curl to it. So I figured what the heck, uh, turned it uh, to the specifications on the plans, uh, the plans that you download from toolsforworkingwood.com. It calls for a half inch round peg with a um, indentation at the top that is actually cut to about a quarter of an inch or about half the thickness. And you can style that however you want, basically round over the ends. So you end up with a perfectly cylindrical peg with that slight indentation, about seven eighths to one inch down from the top of the peg itself. Then we need to actually cut facets on it to taper the peg down to a little more than an eighth of an inch at the bottom. So it runs from half inch at the top to eighth of an inch, or rather half inch from just below the little segment that the, the line runs through to an eighth of inch down at the bottom. So what I did is actually using the pattern from Tools for Working Wood, I just laid my cylinder against it and kind of marked the center line as well as the extents of that one eighth inch um, thickness. And I just freehanded using a small Sharpie marker, freehanded up the board until I got just below the little segment here. Then I took a molding plane or really whatever you have. You could even use uh, a router bit to cut a V groove in a block or you could cut a groove into the block so that the peg will register on that block. Took a bit of double stick tape, put it down on the block and pressed it down into the, uh, the, the groove here. And then I went over to my bandsaw and just freehanded a line, freehanded a cut down that line so that I free 
a little bit of a wedge and I have my first face is already cut, my first facet and one continuous facet. Um, there's a lot of different ways you could do this. You could end up cutting, it's a five degree angle. You could cut a five degree angle on your guide block and just reference it against a fence, flip it around and do it. I just figured there's no reason to spend a bunch of time on this. Now that I've cut that one facet, I have a kerf on the bottom of the block here that I can pull the peg out, flip it over with fresh double stick tape and just let the bandsaw blade follow the path of least resistance down the kerf that's already established to cut my other facet. Now, this is, this is the power tool method. You could very easily do this using a handsaw, and in retrospect, I'm not exactly sure why I didn't do this. Um, I would probably want to wrap it in uh, a soft cloth and affix it in my vise, and then just saw down a line. I could sketch out a line like I, like I did before, just saw right down that line. You'd need a back saw with a significant depth of cut, or you could just use uh, a panel saw, an unback saw to saw that down and then clean it up using a hand plane or a chisel. I'll end up cleaning up my bandsaw marks using a hand plane anyway. Now we want to fit the twine to it. So all I'm going to do is just cut off a, a length of twine and I want to wrap the twine twice around the saw. I'm going to fall back on my uh, rock climbing background and tie a double figure eight knot. I figure if this knot was strong enough to hold me to the rope all those years, <laughs> it's strong enough for this bow saw. You just want to cinch up the knot. And really, it should be, the loop should be relatively tight. Well, not tight, but it should be relatively close when you're done tying it up. Just singe the tips to keep them from fraying. And now, you can take your toggle and actually slide it through the loop you've created and start twisting just to lock it in place. But when you first tighten it up, you may have to tighten it a little more significantly just until this cinches up. I'm going to go one more. Good. So now the saw is tensioned. And because this twine is, is fresh and new, what I'm going to do is let it rest. I'm probably going to come back um, and have to retension this once I've removed these wings, because obviously these will be thinner, so it's going to introduce more slack into it. But I want to let it sit here and kind of condition under, under tension for a little bit and just let it do its thing. So I'll come back in a couple hours or so and I'll begin shaping the side wings. gave my new saw some time for the twine to just kind of naturally tighten up and adjust to the tension. And I came back and released the tension, of course, and just kind of checked everything, made sure that all the joints still look good, wanted to check the uh, uh, overall integrity of the piece. And I began shaping one of the arms. And then I thought, you know what, I should double check one more time. So I tightened the saw up. And when you first start tightening it, a lot of times you're, you're listening for the tone of the blade. If you can hear that, there's a little bit of a rattle in that. Whereas properly tensioned, it should ring. So I started tightening the saw and listening to the pitch and I kept realizing I was tightening an awful lot. And the twine up top, was, up top was getting really, really taut. And I kept thinking, something's wrong here. Something's not right. 
this is not tensioning properly. So fortunately, I do have this saw from Gramercy already. And I just kind of held them up against one another, and I could already see that this saw was longer. Obviously, the center cross piece had been cut too short on my saw. So I took it apart, and I thought, you know what? I'm a little bit under. I'm probably about an eighth of an inch under the 13 and a half from 10 and n to 10 and n length that's required. Thought about a bunch of different ways that I could possibly salvage it. Really, there is no way without creating a big gap at the shoulder. So I had to make another piece. Fortunately, this cross piece came out of a piece of bird's eye maple that was a, a thicker uh, two by turning blank and I had resawn it to get a second piece. So I cut that down to 13 and a half inches and I cut the tenons and then I realized this piece was too short, believe it or not. Unbelievable. And then it suddenly occurred to me that I was cutting the overall cross piece to 13 and a half inches like I should have, but I was making the tenon three eighths of an inch long to match the depth of the mortise and the tenon actually needs to be a quarter of an inch long. So I was ending up with an extra eighth of an inch of, of tenon length on both ends, meaning my shoulders were an eighth of an inch further in, so the whole saw was coming together a full quarter of an inch too far. The mortises are set three eighths of an inch deep to provide a little bit of gap in the back so that as the saw tightens and relaxes, there's room if the tenons butt right up against the bottom of that mortise, they can't rock at all without the corners digging in. And that causes really way too much tension on this focal point. So there needs to be a little bit of a gap from the end of the tenon to the bottom of the mortise. In this case, we want to leave an eighth of an inch gap on both sides. So cutting my shoulders in a quarter of an inch overall in too far was giving, pulling the whole saw together that quarter of an inch, and that's why I wasn't able to get it tensioned properly. I actually got it tensioned pretty well and was able to make a decent cut, but it was a very sloppy cut. I didn't have as much control as I wanted. So after two attempts, I thought, you know what, I've screwed this up a second time. I'm going to call it a night. And I came back in the next morning and I prepared another piece. Unfortunately, I don't have any more uh, bird's eye. I've got a little bit of curl, curly maple with just a tiny hint of bird's eye. So I thought, right, this will be a great piece because it's added some curl in, it's really cool figured. Planed it, got it all dimension, then <laughs> realized I had cut the overall piece instead of cutting it 13 and a half inches long. For some reason, I cut it to 13 and a quarter inches long. So just to show you guys, every once in a while, you encounter a project that you are just cursed on you can't seem to do anything right. So it's now been three times, and I actually posted this on uh, Google Plus the other night, that I can't believe I screwed it up twice, I'm going to bed to prevent the three-peat. I think I jinxed myself, and I screwed it up three separate times. So I went digging through my turning stock, and I found another blank, I cut it to 13 and a half inches, I cut one quarter inch long tenons, and I've got a good fit. So I guess the silver lining to this whole thing is the piece that I ended up using, and I don't know if the camera can quite pick that up, it's possibly one of the curliest pieces of maple I've ever seen. On all four sides, it is tight, tight, tight tiger maple. There's no bird's eye in this, but I've got a fair amount of bird's eye in the arms here, and I think this cross piece will really be a nice showpiece. So that being said, I need to take this thing apart and refit the whole thing and I'll do my tests again, I'll tension it up, make sure everything's looking good <clears throat> and then I'll resume shaping the side pieces. So I've got this piece has already been shaped and really again what we're trying to do is get a taper from where the mortise is all the way up to the top. You can taper it to between a quarter and an eighth of an inch across up top. If you're feeling daring, go all the way to an eighth of an inch up here. Uh, I think you'll be fine. What I did was just lay a, a ruler along the top, and I, I've got a three-quarter inch piece here. Laid a ruler along the top. I marked a line a quarter of an inch in on each side, leaving a quarter inch in the middle. 
I marked on my pattern where the taper begins. There's a line on the pattern that shows that. I used a square to transfer that across the back and transfer it on the other side. And then I just freehanded a line from my quarter inch mark up at the top down to my mark here and got a nice pleasing taper. Then just clamping it upright in the vise, I tackled it with a spoke shave to gently taper both sides down. I went on both sides of it, got it tapered down nicely, got a nice even flat facet. Then what you want to do is round over the whole back side of this, just a very gentle kind of bull nose curve. And that was just a matter of again clamping it upright in the vise and using my spoke shave to lop off the corners and slowly rotate around to produce, produce a nice round back. You can then, if you have maybe some roughness because of this figured wood, you can tackle it with rasps and files. I just found that I came straight to my mill file and I just kind of worked it across and removed those facets. I didn't really have any tear out, but I had you know, spoke shape facets and I wanted a nice smooth transition. When you're sawing, this piece, your, your finger will run across it, your hand will run up against it. You don't want any sharp edges here. You want it to be very, very comfortable. The last thing to do is to cut a slight finger indentation on either side. Right as the saw comes to the bottom, it ducks in in this little kind of half moon shape. And what it does is allow a place to put your finger. Your finger fits right in there. The beauty of making this saw from a kit like that means that you can custom design the depth and the width and the positioning of that little half moon shape. Perfect example, on the Gramercy saw as it is, when I grab hold of it, first of all, the handle wants to be longer. My hand is much, much larger. So I made a handle that is longer by about a half an inch. It's a little bit slimmer as well. I like the feel of a slightly slimmer handle. But when I bring my finger across, it doesn't, it doesn't line up perfectly here. It's more of an angle down as I grab the, grab the blade. So what I'm going to do is I took my piece and I laid my finger across where I would comfortably want to saw and I just traced around it with a pencil and created kind of a half moon shape on the side. And I'm going to tackle that with a gouge that closely matches that curvature and just work very lightly across the grain until you remove it down and get it nice and even on both sides and technically both of the arms even though you won't really be needing it on the other side because the only time you'll be grabbing that handle is with another hand and you won't be running a finger across just call it symmetry and, and beauty in the tool so really once that's shaped it's time to string it back together, tension it, and take it for a test run. I retensioned the line and uh, then untensioned it for a bit. And really, from a resting spot, you should only have about three turns to make. And you get a nice, nice tone telling me that I am now tight. go. So all that's really left to do at this point is blow off all the dust, put some finish on this.